So welcome to the Max Weber interview of this month. Um, this will be an interview with Susan Hecht, who is professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, and also at the Graduate Institute for Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, the interview will have the questions of Shada Shakumini, uh, which is a master fellow affiliated to the law department, and myself, Thomas Bartoletti, also a master fellow affiliated to the history department. In the last days, we experienced a lot of headlines in the newspapers about the Brazilian election and the future of the Amazon. Susana uh, is an expert in the history of globalization and Amazonia, and one of the most important books about the history of Amazonia indeed is The Fate of the Forest, um, Developers, Destroyers and Defender of the Amazon, which was published in 1919, reedited in 2010, and probably there will be more introductions and afterwards in the coming years. So, Susana, um, last Sunday was the Brazilian elections, and as we know, the Amazon and the deforestation of, of the forest suffered quite a lot in the last years. And so, which are the challenges that the new regime of Lula has to recover and to, uh, if possible, come back to the state uh, before the regime of Bolsonaro? Well, it was a very close election, as you know. It went by, as they say, by a whisper. Um, and as we're speaking, there's quite a bit of the base of Bolsonaro is, you know, out in the streets, clamoring for a return to dictatorship, which, of course, was the moment in which the sort of Amazonian debacle involving deforestation began to unfold. There's been many debacles, but this was the one that was particularly important in terms of changing forest cover. Um, Bolsonaro basically took all the regulations and forms of control over deforestation off of the um, off of the political sphere and off of the off of the radar. This involved destruction and uh, gutting of institutions, um, degazetting conservation areas, demonizing social movements, trivializing uh, racial groups and their territorial rights, and in general saying that the forest wouldn't be an obstacle to Brazilian development. Now, what we do know from many studies is actually forest destruction is not translating into a universalized development, but rather into creating lots of money for particular coteries while very much in increasing inequality elsewhere. So it's a complicated situation, um, one that is not easily resolved just through an election. First of all, there's a kind of a lag time, and even the formal sectors will not be able to be so easily managed, and the clandestine sectors of timber plunder, gold plunder, land grabbing, and so on, those will be almost impossible to control in the short term. And I think what we're talking about here is the short term. That's the, a little bit the uh, issue that we are facing. So the question is, what can Bolsonaro do? Because he said, I'm going to put an end to illegal gold mining, we're going to reduce deforestation very quickly, and um, the Amazon will become uh, a place in which uh, Brazil can use as a, an example of its uh, probity and importance in climate change and how it's a climate leader. Um, when he, during his first mandate, it is true that deforestation dropped by 80%. So from 2004 to 2012, deforestation really declined. And this was due to a really complex alignment of international pacts, international support for alternatives to deforestation, a lot of experimental activities, a very strong institutional development, social movements, indigenous movements, all aligning to both enhance the returns to a standing forest um, to, and to um, social welfare at the same time. 
So it is possible to imagine a world in which you have uh, an inhabited forest that is uh, intact and continuing to suck up carbon and so on. The alternative model was simply one based on, which is Bolsonaro's model, which is one based on dismantling that whole apparatus, uh, shattering the international alliances, and favoring both the clandestine and the um, agro-export development that, that is creating more and more inequality. So the thing is, as I always like to say, we'll find out, but it will take a while for Bolsonaro to reassemble the coteries and the infrastructure, whether it's institutional, the social movements, all of those kinds of things that occurred. There's been a lot of international solidarity about this because climate scientists are absolutely panicked about the loss of Amazonia as being one of the key triggering areas for massive climate change. So there's been, he's been receiving a great deal of positive attention and reinforcement, but there also is the national question about what can be transformed so quickly. And this remains an open question still. He will, because of his narrow, his narrow mandate, it's less than 2%, whether he can actually govern is another set of questions. And the other thing is during Bolsonaro's time, Bolsonaro managed to overturn about 500 um, elements of relevant to conservation, relevant to keeping uh, social development in Amazonia going forward in an environmentally conscious way. So we'll find out what happens at this juncture. Yeah, um, just to come back again to your book and this comment that you, you are, you are this, this panorama that you are presenting, um, I'm interested to know the emergence of China as an important international actor and to what extent this is the influence, the Chinese influence in the uh, agro industry and the population is affecting the, the Amazon. Well, uh, at the end of the Cold War, the end of the authoritarian period, really, which is about 1988, 1989, that long year, um, uh, American um, stature had really declined in, um, in, in South America. It had been a leading promoter of authoritarian modernizing regimes, Brazilian, um, well, I hope we can edit this part up. Let me just say it again. Um, the United States had, had promoted authoritarian regimes throughout South America and Central America. When they finally moved off the scene in the, in the mid-90s, in, in essence, people didn't want to be part of the informal American empire anymore, particularly. Um, and the U.S. became much more interested in Middle East politics, and so there was, if you will, a kind of geopolitical void. When China entered the WTO, there were a couple of things that happened. One was that, in essence, very well-made, inexpensive Chinese goods flooded South America. And like other places, what it meant was that the incipient industrialization and its industrial capacity was not as efficient or as high quality as the Chinese materials that were coming in. And so you had a China shock, and you had this kind of all over the world with the opening of um, markets to China. So that was one thing. The other thing is that China began to sort of imagine, if, if Africa is China's second continent, uh, began to imagine um, South America as its third continent, and also as the expansion of soy and corn continued, the Chinese provided a ready market for it. So, because they do a lot of confined animal production in China, particularly pigs and so on, again, the demand for, for grains and inputs for animal food became very important. This is also true of the Middle East and also other parts of Asia. So one of the things that happens is that there's kind of a, there's an opening, there's a geopolitical void, and 
the Chinese are ready there to become their maximum trading partner. The other thing is that they become uh, interested also in investment, and particularly in infrastructure investment, and they're quite good at doing this. So one of the other things is that they become important partners in infrastructure development, road development, dam development, and so on. And unlike earlier phases when you had multilateral organizations or international organizations more generally, which insisted on human rights and at least an environmental impact report for licensing, what happened in this case was that, in essence, the question had turned away from a social development policy into an engineering question. And so in that sense, the impacts and the costs of these projects were simply not calculated to the same degree as before. And also, the accessibility, the levers, the acupuncture points that you might have been able to use to produce a better set of policies simply evaporated in the larger contracting dynamics between the contracting companies in, um, in, in Latin America and in the Amazonia, Pan Amazonia, compared to what had been before. The other thing is, of course, that. Um, uh, South America is quite rich in oil and um, had gotten into many kinds of debt situations. So in, in a place like Ecuador, what you simply had was that the Chinese said, well, we'll, uh, we'll cut a deal, we'll take your oil. And so it become very convenient in terms of the distance and the dynamics and already the other kinds of engagements to continue investing in infrastructure and natural resource extraction of multiple kinds, as well as the agro-industrial products. Um, from your words, we can see that there are two narratives that are different about the Amazon. On the one hand, we have this development narrative and the fact that the Amazon should be productive in a way, should be incorporated into national strategies for development. But on the other hand, we have uh, indigenous knowledge and indigenous conceptualization of the environment as a sacred place. Um, so how, how do you see this uh, difference and how did you perceive this difference in your experience with indigenous uh, people in uh, the Amazon, the countries you visited? Well, first of all, there's often the idea that uh, indigenous knowledge is not particularly, you know, it's like sort of superstitious or something, or it's like it doesn't come off of you know, like understanding processes very well. Um, they understand process, they, they, them, indigenous people, um, understand a lot of processes extremely well. Um, I, I, last night I showed you some of these pictures of large scale infrastructure developments and so on, um, that come from, that come from indigenous knowledge. So that, you know, they're, these were kind of brilliant uh, engineering societies. But the other thing I was going to say is like if we're thinking about indigenous knowledge as being sort of arcane, I would probably guarantee that you will be eating um, an Amazon domesticate that was done several thousand years ago, 8,000 years ago. But there's chocolate, there's chiles, there are pineapples, there are manioc, there's sweet potatoes, peanuts, um, I could go on for a, a, a Brazil nuts, and then acai, of course, I'm going to mention those in a minute. But the point is that there are some very widespread um, Amazonian domesticates that you might not think of as being Amazonian domesticates, but that have been in global commerce for the, before 500 years ago, but within the Western universe for 500 years. And very important, cacao being one of them. But, um, so one of the things is that they have a very, very broad um, suite of uh, crop domesticates. And we're in a heating world, as, as if we hadn't known. And one of the things is perhaps these uh, tropical crops may become much more in interesting. The other thing is that there have been very vibrant economies that have been built off of indigenous knowledge and indigenous products. I'm thinking, of course, of acai, the palm fruit, the super fruit um, that is uh, so beloved by Californians. Um, and that is grown in areas that flood, that have 
have been traditionally produced for thousands of years and um, is part of a sort of small farm uh, economy in the Amazon estuary. So one of the things is that indigenous knowledge doesn't have to be something that we imagine to be so arcane. The other thing is I often sort of sit around and think, well, Amazonia has, has historically had, you know, big floods. It has, you know, it goes up and down, the river, the, the, the river itself goes up and down. It's had serious droughts. What can we learn from this? Well, from the water side, you can learn to think about how you structure larger landscapes so that they can tolerate high degrees of flooding and intensiveness. And that is a more general lesson from Amazonia that we can get. The other thing is that um, if you want to think about um, medicinals, if you, quinine, for example, or serpin and other kinds of things, and psychotropics, I wouldn't want to say, but there's coca and ayahuasca that are in wide use throughout the Atlantic world. Um, but there's a lot of information about how to use different kinds of things. However, they have been sort of the topics and, um, and uh, subjects of biopiracy. Now, if I'm going to go plant Monsanto soy in Amazonia, I have to, in the price of my seed, is a royalty price that goes to the seed developer. So, uh, and, and that's how seed companies make money, is off of these royalties. It's not just selling the seeds, it's selling the royalties as well. Um, now, if I want to use an Amazonian product, and what happens is that it's global heritage. That is, it's open commons, anyone can use it, and has no, no there's no return to the, um, the local community or even the regional community. It's, it's a hard set of questions, but you know, if you want to think about redistributing some of the benefits of these economies that are giant in the world, basically the people who came up with the raw materials aren't getting anything from it. And it's just another form of value extraction. So one of my big point here is that we're engaged in using the products of ind indigenous knowledge all the time, and there are many more. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, well, biopirates, you know, suit up, but um, there are many, many other kinds of things that can be used. The second thing is these are major engineering societies, and um, one of the things that's really important is they men have extraordinary infrastructure for flooded areas, and areas by the sea that are flooded, and also internal areas like in the Beni that are flooded, and I think I just showed you some of those slides, you know. So one of the things is that they have dominated a world of water, which we are moving into uh, ever more quickly, and a world of hot water, if you will. So this is another thing. So indigenous knowledge is not just in some kind of metaphysical sphere, but also in a very material sphere. And again, there's quite a bit to be learned from this because it's not just the thing that you just transfer, you know, day to night. It's a much more complicated thing. The other thing is that if you look at the Amazon assessment report, whether it's hard scientists, social scientists, um, anthropologists, and you know, any and the indigenous people, they will all say the problem that we have right now is the way we relate to the world, to the living world. Um, and the living world is everything. It's not just you know, a plant or animals. It's the, the global entity itself. And what they say is this. Um, if we don't change how we know the world, that is not separating it into like little discrete problems and then you solve one and you forget about everything else, but that the way that one understands and confronts the world uh, as it, and knows the world, what's called epistemology, the emic approach, um, has to be different. And they would also say, and others would say, that the way of being in the world, the ontology in the world, has to really be different. And it sounds, these things kind of sound, well, you know, thank you, Susanna, for your, you know, your nice uh, normative comments here. But remember, people used to think, well, slaves. You know, there's, 
they should be slaves. Uh, they're, they're natural slaves. Besides, they're inferior anyway. So ideas given on women, they should never be you know, permitted to do anything except stay at home, take care of children. So uh, fixed ideas about how you relate to different forms of ways of organizing the world are not unknown in human history. Um, we take these stories of slavery and women as easily understood by us, but we can try and imagine a different way of being in the world. And so equal, equalist societies are perhaps, um, you know, as they say, uh, the, these are forgotten founders, the model for the U.S. Constitution actually came from the Iroquois Federation about how you would organize a society of equals among different. The other thing is remember that even in the face of you know constant threats for over 500 years, Amazonian populations have maintained quite a bit of cultural integrity. That is, there's something about being Amazonian and being the kinds of Amazonians they are that they really like. So from this point of view also, preserving indigenous knowledge and all of the things that I'm sort of mentioning, engineering, water management, um, domestication of, of, um, of, uh, of, of crops are really important, as is also these other kinds of anthropogenic soils, and I won't go into that. But the point is that there's a lot to learn and um, we don't know how to manage these systems, and we don't know how to manage the systems that are coming at us right now that are hotter, wetter, and uh, more intense than what we, has gone before. But Amazonians might give us some important clues. Thank you so, so much for, for this. Um, another question I have is, um, uh, how do you see the interlinkage between uh, territorial rights of indigenous peoples and uh, environmental conservation and protection of the Amazon, especially in the Brazilian context, and how this is linked to uh, the importance of environmental defenders nowadays? Well, as you know, because you're a lawyer, uh, and environmental defenders have targets on their backs now, I think. Um, it's not Amnesty International, it's Human Rights Watch says that uh, being an environmental defender is one of, the, um, uh, one of the riskiest jobs you can have right now in terms of just getting killed, but also in terms of general intimidation and so on. So the question about territorial rights is that we, it, it, territories basically bundle things together and they're under a similar form of governance. So the thing about territorial rights is it's not like divvied up into soil rights or land rights or air rights or rights to trees or something like that. It's a totality and there's a system of governance that goes with that. So um, it, it keeps places intact even though people are interacting with these environments a lot. The problem that conservation has, I think, in places like Amazonia is it's always imagined as a place that doesn't have people. But the forests really have social lives. So they are essentially a jointly co-produced set of places that are, they're domesticated landscapes with a lot of reflexivity and interaction among them. So that conceptualization is very different from, well, it's just an ecosystem that doesn't have a history and it should just sit by itself, as to seeing these as sort of environmentally, historically produced um, uh, places and entities. So that's one thing. Now, within that, um, the reproduction of those kind of depends on, um, it kind of depends on people. As they say, a forest is one big thing. Um, you, need, you need to have the forest there, but you also need to have the people to tell you what's going on. So it's for this reason also that these inhabited forests need to be protected because there's a lot of change going on in lots of different dimensions and you need reportage. It's like the Arctic with its changes. It requires actually indigenous people to tell you what's going on because you can't measure everything. However great your surveillance is, you're not going to see everything. And other and people who have lived 
and cared for these landscapes, you're going to see a lot. So that's the other thing. And then globally, and also in Amazonia, what we know is that the areas that are managed by traditional peoples, Quilombolas, and indigenous populations, keep that forest intact better than anything else. Those are the kind of hope spots, as opposed to hot spots, that we're seeing in Amazonia. And there's really a movement to sort of do, how shall we say, a kind of firewall, if you will, connecting a lot of these indigenous and traditional people's terrains and territories into kind of a border against this, uh, this in, in, increasing um, uh, destruction that's going on and also the climate change that accompanies it. So if you're going to get rid of these places that, that are at the headwaters, you'll also get rid of the water itself. So this starts to be very important, and not just for ridding, uh, the ridding of the place by deforestation affecting local waters, but they have huge effects on the rest of the Southern Cone and the megacities there. It's important to understand that southern, the southern part of South America has been in terrible drought for the last three years. One more question? Sure. <laughs> Um, okay, now coming to, um, uh, to to climate change, how do you see the connection between uh, this very global problem and the local communities in the Amazon? How are, are they perceiving climate change and uh, how is uh, this, uh, this climate change affecting their fundamental rights? Well, um it's a complicated thing because it's not a direct connection. Um, what we do know is that the climate scientists say that Amazonia is really one of the five big tipping points. So if that goes, then, and it's important for a number of reasons. One is that it's the one that is most inhabited. So if we're looking at the, the Antarctic glaciers, if we're looking at Arctic areas in the Greenland ice sheet, if we're looking at the AMOC and so on, those are not places that are really inhabited. But Amazonia is inhabited, so the efforts that go on there are especially consequential. Um, and so in this sense, we need to be really paying a lot of attention to what the dynamics of land use change are there. So as I just mentioned, there is this issue, which is that Amazonia is, um, uh, the water of Amazonia recycles through itself. And so it, when it, it comes up against the Andes, it puts rainfall into the Andean system, so into the sort of glacial systems of the Andean world. And then it, the, it shifts down, the water mass shifts down in these what are called aerial rivers or flying rivers. Um, and those basically water much of the southern cone and of the area below Amazonia. So the impacts of this for rain-fed agriculture, for transportation, you might not think that you need water for move. Even the Mississippi right now is at such a low level, you can't do any shipping on it. So imagine some of the great uh, corridors between North and South, uh, Southern, uh, North and Southern America, or not North, North and South America, Southern America are essentially now um, uh, constrained by the problems of not being able to move, uh, move on the river. Also, there's hydropower issues. There's the Pantanal, which is the world's largest um, wetland, a third of which burned two years ago. Um, and there's also the water ecosystems and fisheries and livelihood dependence that goes along with that. Not to mention the dependence of water by large megacities such as Sao Paulo on these sources. So when we're looking at climate change, it has a huge impact on um, not just locality where, where the dynamics first unfold, but also on the longer and larger production of uh, the instabilities that are produced elsewhere. So this is one of the reasons, this is called teleconnection among uh, climate scientists. And so the teleconnections of Amazonia have huge amounts of impacts, not just in the Andean world, not just in itself, but also as uh, a sort of mediator of, of uh, hydrologies of South America. The other thing, of course, is that 
with increasing deforestation, you're getting increased instabilities in the functionality of the forest itself. It's not so able to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. In fact, now it's become an emitter in many areas and that are becoming more deforested because the forest itself is degrading and emitting carbon as it does so. The other thing is if it really does go through a bio flip, which is, it seems to be increasingly possible, or let's hope maybe not, um, that will be basically releasing a carbon bomb. On the other hand, there are other kinds of dynamics that are also going on that would cause us to fret. There are lots of areas that are peak soils in Amazonia, about a third. And right now, there are development and infrastructure plans that go right through these areas, including oil development. So one of the problems that one is worrying about is as those, as those roads come in and as deforestation goes along, these are areas that really are already carbon bombs, and so once you destabilize them, they will destabilize much, much more. So in the, face, <clears throat> excuse me, in the face of all of this sort of potential climate impact, um, there's a lot of urgency to not destroy these landscapes because the consequences are not just in terms of whether Sao Paulo will have enough water, but whether the planet itself will continue to function in the way that it has in the past. Will it be an inhabitable planet? Um, the answer is if one can do certain things, maybe we can slow the rate of change. So there's a lot of inertia um, as a function of the last four years, which have been driving a lot of deforestation um, and a lot of informal deforestation in the form of roads, uh, informal roads. But what we really need to be thinking about is what will it take to slow this down? Well, we have some ideas about what will work because we know we could slow deforestation there by 82% you know, a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. But whether those can be implemented quickly enough is another set of questions. In that context, the areas that are protected by indigenous populations are extremely important because they're keeping those forests up, even though those areas are under incredible attack. So that's, um, that's one of the things that's really important to, to keep in mind in all of this. And then, as uh, Davi Yanomami points out in his book, The Falling Sky, describing the sort of onslaughts of the Yanomami from miners and general diseases and uh, a long history of attempts to destroy the society, um, and the environmental changes that have come along with gold mining and mercury toxicity, the sort of Amazonian minimata, where basically rivers are poisoned by mercury. What he says is, what's happened and is happening to us will happen to you. And so it's, I don't want to use the boring term canary in the gold mine, but it is one of these things where the future is, in some sense, its implications are already written in parts of Amazonia. So we need to be paying particular attention to it because it's a moment in which there's a lot of consciousness about it and in which very clearly the climate is becoming more and more unstable. And this is the one area on the planet where really a lot of emphasis on the land use dynamics can really make a pro profound um, difference. The other thing is development doesn't just have to mean deforestation. That you can have complex economies that are forest-based, that have been forest-based, and can do so for centuries. So it's not to say, and then there's some kind of pristine, ahistorical, and, and uh, anti-economic development that will go forward. We have to rethink this. And one way is sort of rethinking about what a bioeconomy bio -economy would look like in an Amazonian context. We are coming to an end, uh, but before uh, we, we, cl we close the conversation, um, I would like to shift uh, our, our, our talk from not what you know, but 
how you know what you know, because you are one, considered one of the founders of the analytical approach, political ecology, and you collaborate with biologists, archaeologists, and all different kinds of disciplines. So when you started, this was an emergency, but nowadays, and with the environmental crisis, political ecology seems to be everywhere. Still, institutions, uh, universities, and also the, the European University Institute, where we are now, um, yeah, still there is uh, a difficulty to include uh, political ecology and environmental issues in the curricula. So, which are the, the challenges that these institutions are facing, or, or the bias that some disciplines still have to embrace more generally political ecology as, as such? Um, it's a really good question. Part of it was that um, I'm trained as a geographer, but basically I spent a lot of time in the forestry school, in the agri agricultural economics department, and in the uh, anthropology department. So uh, I had a home, but I was free range. I was unsiloed. Um, and that had to do with a particular moment. Also, it had to do with um, having a cohort that was very interested in trying to understand the impacts of the kinds of development that were unfolding in the, in the 1970s and how to assess what was going on. So it was informed in many ways by the environmental movements in the United States. But it was also informed by um, historical archaeology and historical geography. It was my great luck to be in a department which spent a lot of time thinking about the history of these places. And so it meant that framing the question in terms of history rather than just in terms of the moment or in terms of you know environmental impacts or in terms of um, uh, what you could see in the moment, but to start to use history as a framing device became very important because it, you have to be able to track changes. And remember, most of the time, these environmental issues are described either as externalities, that is, there's something that's not supposed to be there, and technically resolvable. And actually, you can't, and neither of these is, they're both true and not true at the same time. The point is that there are broad structural things that keep going forward, and externalities, as we know, is sort of uh, is a feature of current capitalism. It's not a bug. That is, the costs of things are maintained at the cost of the environment, the collective goods that we all uh, end up paying for in terms of higher costs for our health, for the climate uh, damage that we experience. So one of the things is to understand that there are power relations and there are structural relations that are developing these kinds of stories about Amazonian and other forms of development and political ecology. So one of the things that I think is really important in political ecology has been its his historic richness. That is, it doesn't start from the now. It starts from, you can't really understand this without seeing how things unfold. The second thing is that if, um, if environmental problems are a feature and not a bug of current capitalism, then one has to really start to look at what the consequences of this model really are. Now, it may be possible to ameliorate a lot of it. Maybe not. We don't know. We'll find out, as I always say. But the point is that you have to be paying a lot of attention. Um, to the historical and then the, con and then the consequences. The other thing is that there are very clear power relations and different visions and models in play. So the reason political ecology became so important is it was sort of saying, but look, this major model that everybody has signed into actually has a lot of resistance against it. And these resistance movements actually have interesting alternatives if we want to think about longer term resilience, if we wanted to think about longer term futures, and how we might reorganize these societies. So the thing is that I was very lucky in terms of the timing of when I uh, did my graduate work. But the other thing that I would say is that um, right now there's attempts at de -siloing. And um, so you see environmental groups 
working more strongly for environmental departments and so on, putting more social sciences and environmental historians and environmental humanities into their schools. Um, and you see a little bit of this more environmentalism stuff coming into other disciplines. But um, there's still a particular rigidity. Actually, the scientists have been perhaps a little more eager to have social scientists and human humanists um, as collaborators than, you know, let's say planners or um, uh, the sort of classic social scientists, science disciplines, not counting geography, because geography's always had to. So the problem is that in a certain sense, the um, fusion of insights and epistemologies and ways of thinking about the world come a bit late. But that doesn't mean they're irretrievable. It just means perhaps accelerating the whole time. We're in great acceleration. Good. Thank you, Susanna, for sharing your knowledge, your experience, and all your wisdom. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you, and it's been an honor. I'm so delighted with meeting you and being here. So, 